Richard, you can start. Sure. Hello and good evening. On behalf of the Office of Global Engagement, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural session of the IIT Madras Research Initiative Spotlight or the IRIS webinar series. My name is Richard George Philip, and I'm the Principal Program Administrator for IOE Initiatives at the Office of Global Engagement. It is said that investing in science education and curiosity-driven research is investing in the future. IIT Madras has over 68 new cutting-edge research initiatives across 21 technology clusters that we intend to showcase through the IRIS webinar series. Without further ado, I'm excited to introduce the Director of IIT Madras, Professor Bhaskar Ramamurthy. Professor Bhaskar's areas of specialization are communications and signal processing. His research work is in wireless networks, modulation, wireless data, and audio and video compression. He is currently also Honorary Director of the Center of Excellence in Wireless Technology, a public-private initiative at the IITM Research Park to make India a wireless technology leader. He is a member on the institutional body of AIMS Madurai. He is a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. He was awarded the Vasvik Award for Electronic Science and Technology, the Tamil Nadu Scientist Award for Engineering and Technology, India Semiconductor Association Techno Visionary Award, Doyens of Madras Award for 2014, ACCS CDAC Foundation Award, and RWTH Honorary Fellow Award. Thank you for being with us today, sir. In conversation with Professor Bhaskar, we have Dr. Karthik Raman. Dr. Karthik is a faculty at the Department of Biotechnology, IIT Madras. He is also an advisor at the Office of Global Engagement, coordinating the IRIS webinar series. Over to you, Professor Karthik. So welcome to one and all. We're really excited to have you, have you over here at this uh, IRIS webinar series. Um, and I join Richu in welcoming Professor Bhaskar, and I would like him to uh, start talking to us about his initial thoughts on the IOE initiative itself, right, which is uh, the sort of seed for this entire webinar series. Uh, Professor Bhaskar. Thank you, Richu. Thank you, uh, Karthik. Um, good afternoon to everybody who has joined this uh, webinar series, branded as IRIS. So IRIS is, uh, is um, providing a spotlight on the new research initiatives at IIT Madras. So what are these new research initiatives about? Of course, IIT Madras faculty and students have always been uh, engaged in serious research. It's been for years together, decades. So what's new? Well, what's new is that with uh, with the uh, uh, with the with the um, tag of institution of eminence that has been bestowed on the institute by the government of India, we also receive a certain amount of funding for the for the five years. And what IIT Madras is doing, the significant part of that funding, is to actually seed some new major research initiatives in areas that are very important, that are being explored globally, in areas that are very important also for India, sometimes in technologies, development areas that are critical for India. And the idea being that, and in many of these areas, the it is in the nature of things these days that the work is highly interdisciplinary, that is where all the exciting new discoveries are waiting to be made. So many of most of these initiatives, if not all, actually are multidisciplinary, involving faculty and scholars and others from many, many disciplines. It is also in the nature of things that today, major research today, that you get the best outcomes if you put your heads together across the world. People from different research groups in different parts of the world, different institutions, bringing their capabilities together to apply their minds on the challenges usually leads to much better outcomes, better ideas, new ideas that somehow did not germinate in the individual teams at these 
institutions spread across the world. So these initiatives are also almost ab initio, very uh, international in their approach. All of them have partners, collaborators at institutions in different parts of the world. So triggered by the IOE funding, IIT Madras went through a process of discovering these new research uh, initiatives. The faculty went through a process of figuring out what it is that they want to work on by forming teams, by reaching out to collaborators across the world. Of course, in many cases, work along lines that are going to be uh, uh, you know, uh, showcased to you over the next couple of months were, was already progressing in some fashion or the other, maybe in some limited fashion. But in many cases, people have actually embarked on very bold new uh, directions, pulling a lot of people together here in the Institute across disciplines and then reaching out to their, to collaborating partners from elsewhere in the world. So the tag of IRIS for this webinar series is very appropriate. Whoever has coined it, my congratulations to them because it's really a window to the, for people outside to get a glimpse of, these, of the exciting new initiatives that are underway at IIT Madras. We will be providing this window on an ongoing basis. This seminar series, webinar series is just the beginning. There'll probably be follow on webinar series maybe a year later, but there'll also be continuous uh, visibility through our web pages, through the portal, and through various other public engagements that will be uh, uh, set up during the next few years. We hope that this window into the exciting new lines of research that are being pursued at IIT Madras will make it possible for young potential researchers, students to, to uh, get a glimpse of what is possible, what, is, uh, what they can themselves be a part of should they choose to uh, become a student at IIT Madras. We hope that it will be a window for potential research partners whom we haven't yet discovered across the world who feel that if they come together with one of the teams here that actually the sum will be much more than the parts. And to people in industry who may see that yes, there are potential applications, not just much later, but actually in the short term, in the medium term of some of the work that is being pursued and therefore they would like to engage with these teams to understand better and in a shorter loop, instead of waiting for everything to be published and slowly trickle down to understand better what's going on and maybe even partner with the groups to pursue certain research with shorter outcome durations. So we think that this IRIS window will be very valuable to a very large number of people from different segments. And finally, to the man in the street, to the person who's just curious to know what's going on in the exciting world of research at IIT Madras. So welcome to everyone to this webinar series, IRIS, which will highlight major work that's being undertaken in about 21 broadly, very important uh, clusters as uh, Richu called it. But basically these are the 21 areas that we have identified where we have strength and we have a lot of interesting uh, uh, problems to work on, which are very important, and where a number of people at our institute have the knowledge and capability to shed new light on. So these areas have been identified, and you will see them as we go along. Today, we start with one of the clusters, which is advanced materials. As you all know, materials is, you know, is uh, exploding across the world. Everybody is discovering very valuable new materials, new processes, new applications. And of course, you discover a lot of materials for which you really don't know what to do with them at this point in time. 
So this advanced materials, uh, what, I mean, it's obviously we are going to be working, the groups here are going to be working on certain types of new advanced materials and you'll find out more about that uh, in the next, uh, you know, today and maybe in one more, uh, uh, on one more outing. But uh, this is a very important area and we have uh, very interesting uh, problems that have been proposed and that are being worked on. As I said, with uh, multidisciplinary teams here, but also with strong partnerships from across the world. So welcome to all of you. And I hope you find this webinar series very valuable, very enjoyable, and something that you tune into almost you know, twice a week or whatever. I think that's the uh, frequency they are planning. Almost the way that you don't forget to tune into some very interesting program on TV or uh, some sports event that you really like. We hope that you'll find this really enjoyable and unforgettable. Thank you. Karthik, we can, that's all I wanted to say as opening remarks. Okay. So, uh, so could you tell us a little bit more about the IOE initiative uh, of the government of India itself? Yeah. So the government of India, I think, um, uh, went through an exercise to identify a few institutions in India, uh, academic institutions, universities, institutions, um, which they felt were on the track towards becoming uh, globally uh, competitive in terms of the their uh, academic outcomes, these kind of uh, graduates they produce, the kind of research they produce, the kind of impact they have in society and so on. And these were identified uh, a set of institutions were identified in the first round. There may be more as we go along. And uh, they are uh, labeled as institutions of eminence by the government of India. And the publicly funded institutions among them are actually given uh, some funding to, um, to actually accelerate the, their pathway to, to uh, excellence or higher achievement as uh, if you would like to say that. And it is in that context that being a public institution, IIT Madras is receiving about a thousand crores over five years. As per the proposal that we had uh, made in order uh, when we were uh, evaluated for this purpose to, uh, to accelerate our uh, growth towards even higher excellence. And a significant part of the proposal that went from IIT Madras was focused on these new research initiatives. So, so is that the main uh, focus of IIT Madras's approach to um, in the IOE initiative? So leveraging the IOE initiative via interdisciplinary research and what are the main pillars of this? Uh, there are also other things that are tied to it. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we want to do, um, which is, I would say, very important uh, is to in, in, in internationalize in a much bigger way, which means we want uh, many more international partners working with us here. We want many more of our faculty and students working with our international partners in collaboration. We want more international students. We want more faculty from across the world. Uh, so we are going to be doing all of that, but that ties in very well with the uh, research initiatives because that's what will drive a lot of these international uh, internationalization uh, efforts. Though there will be some students who will also be coming in for uh, course programs, but a lot of the international linkages will come from our research initiatives. So the two are, you know, tied together. And of course, when you want to do research, you need resources. You need not only human resources, you need infrastructural resources. So we are also augmenting wherever we felt there are gaps. We're also augmenting our infrastructure for research. I think you already touched upon the importance of the IRIS um, uh, webinar series and how it can be a, a regular affair in terms of a window into um, a spotlight into the kind of research that happens at IIT Madras. And it also, I think, goes well with many other series that uh, there are a regular number of webinars that are happening across the campus all along. So, uh, so anything specific that you want the audience to watch out for in the IRIS webinar series? Right? As I said, I think, uh, you know, the, the IRIS webinar series is not aimed at giving very detailed, uh, you know, uh, in-depth talks uh, to experts in the field, uh, you know, or there may be a few hundred people across the world who really know the depths of the kind of uh, uh, prob problems that are being worked on. 
uh, this, these talks are not going to be aimed at them. These are aimed at a broader audience, but still done in such a way that you can get a feel for the, what the real challenge in, is there in the research problem. So it is, as I said, aimed at uh, potential uh, for possibly people who want to um, uh, will get um, enticed or uh, attracted towards a career in research, students, youngsters. It is aimed at potential partners across the world who may, who may find that, wow, this is the kind of thing that actually I'm also work, working on or would like to work on or would like to pivot towards. So why not I contact them and see how we can partner, collaborate and so on. And third, uh, you know, as I said, industry, a lot of the problems uh, that have been identified are multidisciplinary and uh, many of them have actually potential, uh, potentially uh, low hanging fruit applications. Uh, the research problems are themselves very challenging. So we don't expect very quick, uh, you know, uh, quick and easy results. However, they will have spin-offs that could happen in a short term. And they, it could also turn out, therefore, the industry may be uh, attracted to contact these groups and look at some, uh, you know, in early, uh, early uh, uh, low-hanging fruit, early spin-offs from the research efforts. So we expect uh, this to be a window for all these kinds of people to peep into. And, the, and as I said, the man in the street is always welcome. Man or woman in the street is always welcome. That's true. And I think this uh, webinar series is quite interesting in that we have, uh, it's a very short, very compressed, bite-sized talk with 15 minutes of presentation by uh, uh, one of the investigators, followed by 15 minutes of discussion in equal time to discuss various aspects in terms of how they plan to take the initiatives forward and so on. And I think this can be really, uh, this can give a good insight into for um, everyone involved. True. And how do you see these initiatives maturing in the long run? Where do you see them uh, two years down the line and five years down the line? Yeah, so research is always a risky business. Uh, you know, we don't know. Some things will, uh, will uh, really uh, explode. Some things will peter out uh, on the particular path that's been taken. Then sometimes some things come alive again five years, ten years later because of some new uh, understanding or new tools. Uh, I mean, a good example is AI, right? Neural networks have been around for decades. So I think uh, I can't be, if I could say with, uh, with certainty about what's going to happen, then it probably these are not really, uh, wouldn't be challenging research initiatives. But I can say the following, that, I, that of these 21 large clusters, I mean, I and uh, in those clusters, you know, there are several uh, individual initiatives uh, as projects. I expect a reasonable number to actually explode because they've somehow hit pay dirt and really become large, large, much larger efforts for, uh, in the next five years, involving a very large number of uh, very bright uh, faculty, students, and partners from across the world, and really interesting results uh, to come out of them. And I expect some others to, uh, while they may not quite reach the same, uh, you know, pinnacles of uh, of uh, what you might say. Uh, really, you know, high, high, high uh, uh, growth uh, and high, you know, explosive research. The others, there will be some others that will do very good work, which will also lead to some valuable uh, knowledge and valuable outcomes, valuable applications and so on. So I do expect that ev almost everything, because these have all gone through very, very careful uh, evaluation. I expect all of them to do very well, but some I think will, will hit pay dirt, if you want to say, call that, say it that way. And, and are these uh, initiatives, you know, for our audience, are they distributed across fundamental research, applied research, and, you know, uh, do many of them have potential for direct social impact and so on? What, what are your thoughts? About yeah, that? I think, you know, we avoided all the typical classifications when we went through this exercise. I think if you look at the, and as you listen to these talks, I hope you'll find what I say is true. I think you'll find that uh, in all these efforts, uh, in, in, uh, there, in most of these efforts, there's a strong fundamental research component. There is strong potential for application or maybe very clear application. Uh, there is uh, many of the applications may have societal impact too, meaning uh, not just in terms of improved, increased overall scientific knowledge, not, in, not just in terms of uh, finally, uh, you know, uh, increased value to the economy, but actually in terms of direct impact on the lives of people. And uh, uh, I think many of these initiatives from what I have seen of them have all these aspects to them. Some, a uh, few of them are actually very specifically targeted on very important critical technologies that could change dramatically the way we uh, you know, do things. For example, you know, uh, microgrids or uh, 
you know, energy storage and so on. These are all poised to change the equations of the way, you know, societies run themselves. But, uh, and some of them are therefore highly technology uh, uh, development oriented, a few, but a large number of them have strong fundamental research and technology uh, aspects to them, you know, application aspects to them. And uh, I think uh, in some of them, the, uh, the, the, the fruits might come a little later, you know, compared to the others. Obviously, one area that comes to my mind is quantum computing and so on. Everybody is working very hard at it, but nobody is expecting a comp quantum computer tomorrow uh, to really, you know, uh, take over computing. So some of them have longer gestation periods. Some of them, but you never know when there'll be a major breakthrough. And some of them are uh, very, it's, you know, it's a race. It's a race because we, everybody knows it's in the right direction. If you take energy storage, for example, but it's a race to build something that will crack the code and, you know, change start changing the way we run our lives uh, much sooner than uh, later. And uh, some are probably, uh, you know, just, just exciting basic research. Uh, the applications are not even clear. But actually, in most cases, I would say, um, it's either that there are, uh, you know, very, very powerful uh, in, in impact or applications or uh, consequences, but much further down the line. And some others where we see uh, probably much earlier impact uh, though not of the same magnitude. And uh, in most of the project, in most of the research initiatives, there is a fairly strong fundamental research component as well. Okay, so I think we are running out of time, but I'll ask maybe one last question. We've already addressed uh, how people can contribute to these uh, initiatives in terms of new collaborations, new participants, new grad students, yeah. and so on. But maybe, you know, something for our students who are, you know, back at home and watching this uh, during the pandemic, uh, our own IIT students, so what's your message for them in terms of how they can uh, tag along in these initiatives? I'm sure they are equally excited to watch these webinars to see what the, the faculty who teach them, you know, uh, various courses are up to in a very new research initiatives. So what's your message for them? So first of all, you know, our students have, uh, you know, um, the cross section goes from undergraduate to master's students who are still doing a lot of courses and then whole large contingent of research scholars. Our research scholars, a good number of them are already, you know, on campus or, live, you know, are working, even though the pandemic has, uh, has hit us hard, they are here, they are working. So they, they are probably already, good number of them might already be involved in these initiatives with, through, with their, with their uh, supervisors. And uh, with regard to the new students who joined uh, the research uh, program last year, I'm sure they're waiting to come to the campus. They've all been just taking online courses. I hope, I really keep my fingers crossed. I hope that we'll be able to give them that opportunity in the next few months, you know, as soon as we are already thinking in that direction, but it all depends on how the, uh, you know, uh, what, the, what the authorities say with regard to opening up and how the pandemic plays out. And with regard to under other students who are uh, students of our course programs, I would say, you know, Hey, look, listen to this and you know, who, who, you never know, you might change your mind and you might want to get into research. And if you want to get into research, well, there's never been a better time than this, never been more opportunities. These research initiatives are opening up a lot of openings for people to get into the research program, get into the PhD program and so on. So to all our undergraduate and postgraduate you know, students who are doing coursework programs, Listen and see if anything excites you to the point where you're not able to sleep and you want to uh, get into the research PhD program. Okay. So that's what I would say. Indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bhaskar. It was wonderful listening to you. Uh, Thank your you. thoughts on the IRIS webinar series and the uh, various research initiatives that have been initiated at IIT Madras. Uh, and uh, I think I'll, I'll close this uh, session for now and we will um, we'll probably play a video just uh, to, to, for the remaining few minutes that we have till the start of our very first webinar by uh, Professor Bhasavaraj. Thank okay. you, Karthik. Thank I you. really enjoyed this and I wish uh, this program all success. I'll be you know, tuning in uh, whenever, uh, whenever I'm not uh, taken away by my other responsibilities, but uh, I'd like to be there for every program, but I don't know whether I'll be able to have the luxury of doing that. But wish this program all success. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And for, for your reference and also for those of the participants, we're going to have all of these on a YouTube channel. So you can tune in whenever you find time to catch up on any talk that you end up missing for various reasons. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Shivram, you can play the video.
the audio is not coming shubhra I chosen this institute because it is one of the top leading institutions in India. Academics is something which is the most important thing at IIT Madras. One of the most prominent section of my institute life is doing courses. I have done courses right from sociology to history to politics and as well as in finance. Whatever you study here, you feel it's you know there is a lot to learn in that field and there is a lot which can come out of that field. This student in IIT Madras has given the opportunity to. Consult with industries as well as do research work. We also want to then start working on electric air taxis in about one or two years' time. Here in IIT, the best thing is you can actually know whether you are passionate about this or not because you have the time and also opportunity to explore each and everything. Despite being a business student over here in IIT Madras, the uniqueness over other B schools in uh, India is that I get to network over with the uh, people with other departments as well. It is. No wonder that in the last five years, the major technology startups that have made headlines in India are from IIT Madras. It's a great place to uh, for students to enhance their learning. So here's a preview of the webinars that are up tomorrow. Complex systems and dynamics, very interesting areas again. which we can start in about a minute. So. Good evening, everyone. First in the IRIS webinar series is a research initiative titled Soft and Biological Matter, led by Dr. Madhuwala G. Basavaraj. Dr. Basavaraj is currently an associate professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Madras. He works in the area of experimental soft matter. I will
think there's been a network disruption. Please um, hold on for a moment. Richie, you're back online. Please yeah. Go okay. I welcome Professor Ignacio Mora, who is joining us as a moderator for this session. Professor Mora is presently the director of CSAM, Ecole Polytechnique Federale de la Son, or EPFL. He is also a professor in condensed matter physics in the Department of Fundamental Physics at the University of Barcelona. His research focuses on the border between theoretical physics, chemistry, applied mathematics, and biology spanning various aspects of soft condensed matter. His research contributions are reflected in as close to 300 publications in the leading scientific journals. Thank you for being with us today, sir. Over to you, Professor Basavaraj. Yeah, thank you. Let me switch yeah. my screen. Okay. Is my screen visible to you, Richu? Yes, Basa. Yes, Perfect. Can. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, uh, everyone, for uh, organizing this. And I completely agree with uh, Professor Baskar Ramurthy's word that uh, if you really want to uh, do start research, I think now is the time. Uh, uh, so, with that, I would like to uh, share some thoughts on uh, some of our research initiative, uh, which is titled uh, Center for Soft Matter, Soft and Biological Matter. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Basavraj. I'm a faculty at the Department of Chemical Engineering. Um, and this is going to be the outline. I'm just going to introduce uh, the area for about five minutes, uh, then talk a little bit about uh, the proposed areas of uh, uh, our research, uh, then uh, briefly discuss the team composition and the expertise that we have and the kind of problem that we want to look at you know, as a part of this initiative. Um, I thought it's, uh, it's uh, best to introduce uh, uh, <clears throat> the soft matter word to everyone uh, following the work of uh, uh, Dejen, who was a Nobel uh, uh, Prize winner in 1991. Uh, so uh, uh, soft matter uh, is an area where uh, a lot of material that are considered under this umbrella are uh, polymers, surfactants, uh, liquid crystals, and, and uh, colloidal grains. Uh, and we see that uh, such materials are are there in um, uh, every walk of life. Uh, just to give you a, a brief overview of the different uh, constituents that make up soft matter, you can think of uh, surfactant molecules, which are what are called as a surface active uh, reagents, uh, which uh, are commonly found in any of the cleaning products that you may have used. Uh, uh, polymeric uh, uh, materials, which are uh, used as uh, uh, additives for you know, improving flow properties, enhance performance, cost reduction and so on and so forth. And uh, colloidal particles, which are particles in the size range from one nanometer to one nanometer to about thousand nanometers, which are again used to impart some kind of a structure and flow properties to, to materials. And uh, finally, the liquid crystals, which are some materials which are intermediate between uh, uh, the crystalline solids and isotropic liquids. And uh, again, have a very wide application in the area of uh, uh, liquid crystalline displays and so on and so forth. And I think it's really uh, difficult to uh, identify an area or a material where these things, these uh, ingredients are not present. You can think about food, cosmetic, uh, cosmetics, uh, pharmaceutical, pain, fuels, uh, so on and so forth. I think uh, uh, any material that you have used at some point or the other would have some of these ingredients. Uh, uh, the soft matter or soft materials, uh, it's, it also goes by another interesting name called complex fluids. So that is because uh, the, the length scale uh, that is of interest, it is larger than uh, atomic uh, scale. We are re really talking about multi-atomic uh, or multi-molecular materials. 
And uh, typically people look at collection of particles or polymers as, as a pattern or the combination. And what really is important in such cases is the, the complex interactions that come into the picture when you work with uh, such materials. Uh, another in, important aspect of soft materials is that these materials respond to energy of the order of a few kBT or, or the few times the thermal energy. Uh, just to give you an uh, uh, idea about what is uh, thermal energy, I've taken a, a simple example where you can think about uh, a, a, a liquid which contains uh, particles uh, of few nanometers to few micrometer in, 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 in size range. And if you look at uh, such uh, simple particle filled fluids under a microscope, this is what you actually see. You see that uh, the, all the particles that are there in the, in the, in the, in the fluid, they're being constantly subjected to a chaotic motion. They don't move in any particular or, you know, uh, direction. Uh, they're randomly moving everywhere. That is because the solvent molecules, which have this thermal energy, they're imparting the thermal energy to uh, these particles. And this is what sets the, sets the particles in the fluid into motion. So this is a very uh, interesting phenomena. And of course, uh, the first discovered by uh, Robert Brown in, in uh, 1827. And then about a century later, uh, it was a quantitative work of exactly the same Brownian motion phenomena that led, uh, again, a French scientist, uh, Perrin, to get Nobel Prize uh, for the work uh, where he provided a quantitative analysis of the Brownian uh, motion phenomena, which essentially proved that uh, the, the atoms do exist, uh, you know, is one of the nice histori historical perspective, this particular uh, 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 phenomena. Uh, also, uh, if you look at a lot of uh, biological uh, uh, material, for example, if you can think of uh, cell membranes, uh, um, or the tear film that is there as a part of uh, uh, the eye that um, uh, animals have, or for, for, for that matter, the red blood cells, okay, which are typically about a few microns in size range. So if you look at the basic constituents of each of these materials, again, the, the species that I mentioned, the surfactant molecules or the polymeric molecules or the lipids, uh, proteins, uh, uh, you know, this, this is what basically constitutes uh, such material. Therefore, so our initiative is to look at some aspects of soft matter and some aspects of biological matter as a part of uh, uh, this particular center. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, this area is very popular. You see a lot of uh, popular books written, uh, you know, in this area. And uh, I particularly like reading these books because they help you to connect to the historical developments in this area and then help you to connect to the, the scientists who have worked uh, uh, on these areas to get a motivation for doing work in these areas. Uh, and there's even journals with uh, uh, the name soft matter. Uh, one of the RSC journals is, uh, uh, you know, goes by the name soft matter and even a movie. Uh, of course, uh, the, the ratings of this movie is not great. So I would not recommend you to watch it, but but uh, just to say that, you know, it's a very popular uh, uh, term that uh, is used in uh, uh, a lot of different uh, contexts as well. Uh, uh, just to end the, the first part, uh, the soft and biological matter is a very rich field. Uh, uh, and uh, people who work in this area uh, work at the interface of uh, science, engineering, medicine, a uh, lot of materials that you, uh, you know, uh, are listed here. They form part of uh, one or the other type of, you know, interesting investigation that is carried out as a part of uh, soft and biological matter. Uh, with that, I would uh, give you a brief overview of the, the proposed research in this area. Um, uh, one of the proposed objectives of uh, this particular uh, uh, initiative is to look at uh, what is called the evaporation of complex fluid drops. Uh, you can think of a very simple experiment of a, you know, a droplet that contains either a soluble or, or, or an insoluble uh, substances. And uh, you, know, you can put it on a substrate and let uh, the water or any fluid that is a part of this uh, drop to evaporate. Okay, And in the end, what you have is a, what is called a drying pattern or an evaporative pattern. And uh, so this is actually an everyday phenomena. I'm sure all of you would have observed such a thing at uh, one point or the other. You can think of a coffee spill, for example, a coffee that is uh, spilled on a surface and it is evaporated, or you can think of, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of patterns that are left over when you use water or a, or a slightly polluted water to, you know, uh, wash things, for example. Um, so if you look at uh, the, the, the patterns that result, when you uh, evaporate, uh, for example, coffee, that's the example that I've taken here. So what you see is I've kind of uh, 
uh, done some experiments in the, in, at home, wherein I've kind of put uh, these coffee drops in a specific uh, letter form. This is actually uh, uh, PEX, which stands for the, the lab that I work in, uh, chemical engineering, CHE, and IIT Madras. So what is interesting about these uh, patterns is that, you know, if you carefully look at these patterns, and you see that the edge of the pattern that are left behind after the evaporation of the fluid, it appears more darker compared to the interior region. Um, so you can do more controlled experiments. So these are data from a coffee spill, uh, uh, and this is a, a data from a, a from a tea that is spilled, uh, but a little bit more controlled way. And what is uh, uh, interesting is that you know if you look at the edge of these patterns, you see that the edge is definitely much more darker compared to the interior region. Uh, I'm going to tell you the reason why it is so. And it turns out that this, again, the observations of evaporating droplet, again, was done way back, you know, a couple of centuries ago. And uh, later on, a quantitative understanding of, you know, the phenomena that leads to the formation of such edge deposits is kind of uh, more recent work uh, from, the, from the group of physicists at the Unis University of Chicago. And I'm going to show you a movie to uh, to explain you what actually happens when you have a droplet that is drying. It turns out that if you do a more controlled experiment in a, in a laboratory, this is a droplet uh, which contains five micrometer particles. And uh, what you look at is, is a top view. And you see that uh, there's a, a flow. Uh, typically, this is called as a radial flow. This radial flow is what carries the particles to the, to the edge. Uh, I'm going to uh, play this movie again. Uh, there's a radial flow that carries the particles to the edge. And, um, and of course, you know, there's an accumulation of particles at the edge of the droplet. And initially, the particles go at a very slow speed. And uh, towards the end, you know, the, the particles go at a much faster, faster speed. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of fundamental understanding that is uh, uh, kind of a, a, is an inherent part of the, the work that is going on in this area. Uh, of course, this simple drop drying has a lot of technological applications, as I'm going to show in the next few slides. You can think of a lot of processes where you come across this phenomena. Example could be, you can think of a, a spray drying process where you have a, a complex fluid uh, uh, you know, solution that comes out. You introduce a, a gas stream to atomize the droplets, and these droplets are kind of a, 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 um, collected on a substrate, leaving out a, a nice coating of the, the material onto a substrate. Uh, you could think of inkjet printing. You can uh, generate droplets on demand, uh, look at uh, their uh, deposition on substrates, uh, substrates, and you can actually use it for creating some interesting patterns. Uh, for example, uh, uh, printed circuit board uh, manufacturing uses su such a technology. Or you can think of uh, uh, spray drying, which is a classical chemical engineering operation, which is uh, used for making uh, uh, dry particles or in agricultural application where you uh, spray uh, uh, you know some substances onto the you know, to the to the plant so what is common in all these applications is that you know, there's a formation of a complex fluid drop and the drop resides on the surface or it could be suspended in the gas or air and then ultimately there is drying so therefore the problem that you want to look at as a, a, a very fundamental aspect as well as some applications which have several uh, uh, in interesting implications to industry as well. Uh, just to give you an example of a spray drying, which is a, a, a process for making uh, uh, powder particles, is a, a very extensively used technique for making milk powder, protein particles. You can make uh, drug loaded particles. And we have shown in our recent work that you can make uh, granules of different morphologies by exploiting this process. So, with this uh, background, I uh, we're going to look at uh, you know uh, different aspects, although I've talked about evaporation, but uh, we want to look at structure, rheology, self-assembly, and evaporative patterns in, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at the effect of particle shape, uh, uh, looking at uh, what would happen if you have soft colloidal particles in them, um, polymer colloid mixtures, and how do they behave under different conditions, um, evaporation of blood droplets, and looking at their structure and rheology of such systems, and tear films, which is of importance for the health of the eye itself. So with that, I would uh, briefly introduce the team and its composition. Uh, so we have a diverse set of people who work on uh, both molecular simulations and uh, experimental aspects of uh, soft matter. Uh, Susi, uh, who, you know, who's, uh, who's my colleague, who, uh, she looks at uh, uh, physics and mechanics of polymeric materials, uh, conducting on natural polymers. Uh, uh, Sumesh is an expert in looking at uh, LB simulations for understanding soft and active matter uh, 
a lot of uh, interest in uh, looking at props and spreading problems. Uh, Professor Idayaraja Mani, who is an expert in molecular simulations and looks at uh, several aspects of self-assembly in particular systems, nanoparticles and protein systems, uh, looks at population balance modeling kind of uh, work. Uh, uh, Dilip, who's a physicist, uh, looks at soft uh, colloids, uh, responsive materials, you know, and Abhijit is a well-known figure in uh, the area of gelation and rheology, uh, looks at polymers and composite materials as well. Uh, we have, uh, and of course me, uh, I work in the area of uh, colloids and inter uh, interfaces, self-assembly, spreading and evaporative assembly as well. We have a diverse set of uh, students who are part of this initiative, uh, several postdocs and graduate students who are gonna look at experiments on uh, tear film, soft and active colloids, looking at dynamics of different things, uh, evaporation in inclined surfaces, binary fluids, uh, both lattice Goldman simulations and console simulations to understand uh, this problem. Um, uh, finally, a word of uh, thank you to all our collaborators, uh, very established in their own uh, uh, you know, area. And uh, so we have Anand Ithiraj, who's at the Memorial University, Professor uh, Arun Ramachandran, who is a, a part of the panel, uh, Professor Jan Vermont, who is uh, at ETS Zurich, uh, Professor Ignacio, uh, I would not dare to uh, you know, pronounce his last name, Again, uh, Professor Julia um, uh, Yeomans, uh, who's at the University of uh, Oxford. Uh, they have established in several areas of soft matter, um, looking at self-assembly, uh, polymer physics, uh, statistical mechanics, active matter, um, um, and rheology, and so on and so forth. So with uh, that, uh, I think I'm almost uh, time. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind attention. I would be ha very happy to uh, take part in the discussion that's going to follow. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, uh, Maribala, for this uh, thorough presentation of, of what is the, the objectives of this new center. L let me just also start by congratulating IIT Madras for getting this uh, recognition that basically I think it simply uh, backs what, what is uh, uh, a, a very high standard and outstanding academic institution in India, but not only in India, I think internationally the work and research that is done is recognized. And, and yeah, so it, uh, this is the, the first webinar in this center about soft matter. And we have now the time to, uh, for, for questions and for a dialogue with uh, Maribala. So for all of you who are attending, you can pose your questions through the, through the chat. So if you write your question, I will then uh, rely it to Maribala. Okay, so uh, please, just your, your, everybody is invited to, to participate, to contribute. Maybe while we wait to get some uh, initial uh, questions, I, I was, I mean, wondering, uh, I mean, you have talked about the, the objectives that you set for your, for the center. Uh, you, you have started with this general introduction about what is soft matter and what is the, the relevance of soft matter in the area of advice of the, the wider area of advanced materials. I was curious to understand, I mean, you, you have picked this particular topic around evaporation droplets uh, in complex fluids. It touches many different air, uh, directions and, and areas. But I, I was wondering, wh why did you decide to focus on this particular uh, topic rather than in others? I mean, you have mentioned the research team also has quite a, a broad background in different areas of soft matter. So wh what's special about evaporation droplets? Okay, what's, what's special? Uh, one of the nice things, one of the things that really fascinates me about uh, evaporation is a very simple process. You know, you don't need a lot of, you know, um, uh, high-end techniques to look at evaporation. You know, it's, it's very simple, substrate, drying, you know, a regular optical microscope. You know, I think anybody can do this work. I think uh, you really don't need any sophisticated uh, techniques unlike other, you know, fields of soft matter, that's one. And the second thing is we've already been working in this area for about you know, seven, eight years now. And we, I think we have a critical mass and we gel together and we bring in our own expertise. Uh, you know, there, for example, there's Sumesh who complements us with uh, you know, LV simulations on looking at these problems. Uh, there's Dilip who, who brings in the soft colloids experience. And you know, there's, there's Abhijit and Susi who are experts in uh, looking at you know, rheology of such materials. So I think we have a very, uh, you know, closely knit cohesive group, uh, which I think is uh, one of the reasons why we chose to really work in this area. Mm. Okay. The, I mean, uh, the, as, as uh, ex 
explained earlier by Professor Roman Murphy in, in how this uh, kind of like the vision to set up this center of research. I think it, we, he, he emphasizes the fact that it really quality, excellence, and basic science that, that is something that is really behind these, these ideas or the, this initiative. But I was wondering in this particular uh, area, how, how do you see when setting up the center the interplay between what would be fundamental research? Uh, more applied research and the interaction, for example, with industries that you have in India or abroad? Or... Yeah, I, I think, I mean, although uh, we, we started off thinking about ourselves as a, 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 a group of individuals who do fundamental work, uh, uh, this particular initiative is actually also, uh, we, uh, uh, the vision that we have is that if you look at a lot of uh, pattern formation uh, in biological system when people have looked at you know blood drop drying or you know or other biological fluid drying it turns out that uh, uh, you know all the work that is available there is very qualitative uh, people really do, do not pay attention to details of you know uh, the mechanics of pattern formation uh, you know understanding the fundamental behind you know uh, the pattern formation uh, and of course of course, the final pattern that you get from evaporating uh, blood drops or, or, or any biological fluid drop, uh, people have used that for uh, diagnosis, for example. You know, can you think about uh, point of care uh, diagnostic devices? You know, is, for example, can people just think about taking a simple uh, you know, biological fluid sample uh, at home and then dry the, dry the droplet and then look at the pattern and then already think a little bit about, you know, is this a, is this a disease condition or norm. So people are actually thinking about some applications of that sort. So, so in an attempt, in a, if you really want to do that, I think the fundamental understanding of the pattern formation is really important. Um, and again, we are also looking at a broader ways of uh, really quantifying the patterns itself. You know, we're going to use quantitative image, image analysis tools to really think about, uh, uh, you know, uh, bringing out all the morphological features of the deposit. I think that's an important, uh, you know, part before you even go to the diagnostic applications as well. And in the end, of course, we would like to tie up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, doctors and, and other people in the, in, 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 uh, you know, in, in the field of uh, biological uh, medicine, for example, and they really look at also applications at some point. Hopefully that will happen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there, there are a number of questions already from the audience. So I'll try to relay some of them, touching different aspects of, of your okay. presentation. So th there is a first one. Uh, by Mohan Rao asking about basic things required to work in this area. I, I can imagine this maybe by a young uh, student. I mean, I, I think that's also important for you to address to uh, people who are at the beginning of their career and would that's, be interested yeah, in that. That's, yeah. a, that's a great question. You know, uh, the basic thing that's required, in fact, all the patterns that I showed uh, uh, today as a part of this coffering explanation, uh, it was all done in the, at home. Uh, I did it on my, you know, the table on, on which I work. Uh, my daughter helped me, you know, taking some coffee drops and pouring it on, right? And we used the cell phone camera to really record it. And it turns out that you know, now I think uh, the, the instrumentation is becoming very cheap. You know, you can actually get a, a reasonably good microscope with 50x magnification, 2,000 rupees, you know, which is, <clears throat> you know, maybe tens of uh, euros or you know, a few few dollars. It's available on Amazon. You know, you, you can you can buy it. So I think I mean I think the tools that are really required for doing such work uh, is uh, you know not very expensive. I would say you know again de looks depends on what whether you want to look at a lot of details or are you really interested in a broad. Like for example, for imaging the patterns is not you know you can do it with your cell phone camera as well. But if you really want to look at the mobility of the particle, you know how do the particles go? What is the velocity? and stuff like that, that may require a little bit more sophisticated microscope, but you know, now the microscopes are not very expensive, right? I mean, you know, maybe, you know, a few lakhs, for example, a few tens of lakhs, maybe. So in that context, uh, I would say that the basic setup that is required is, you know, ability to maybe make some surfaces, you know, maybe glass surface, for example, steel, you know, we can use it, things that are available to you, you know, at some point, right? And uh, uh, some imaging devices, you know, where I can either look at the the top view of the drying process or, or a side view to really look at you know the, the mechanics of what's happening. Okay. I think that that also addressed, I don't know if you want to compliment, there was another question related by Somali about uh, the different instruments used to study these complexes. I think that's uh, yeah. quite uh, also showing 
that one does need, uh, doesn't need really very sophisticated equipment. And that's, uh, yeah. So th th there is also other, I mean, this, this are a bit uh, question about the connection of the field with other fields. So th there is uh, one about uh, by Kaushish Dutta on how this topic can contribute in biological systems. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, right, I mean, I can pull out some details, but uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I think uh, 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 drying of biological fluids is again an area where there's been a lot of work that is going on. And uh, uh, it turns out that you know, a lot of the work is still very qualitative. I think the, the way, say, for example, one of the ideas that we have is that can we make a, a analog of blood in the lab? Can I make uh, platelet like particles which fit in exactly the same dimension like a red blood cell? Can we synthetically make blood in the lab and then look at evaporative you know, uh, patterns in those systems and compare it to the actual blood, for example? So therefore, I think uh, uh, you can look at this you know, uh, from the point of uh, bringing the fundamental aspects of colloids and interfacial science, the soft matter field, and then bring, it, bring that into the, the, the bio uh, fluid area is something that we are trying to think about along those lines. Yeah. So just looking in a different direction, there, there is a question by Fernando Nieto. He, he, he asked if there is a possibility to contribute remotely to this research field and belong to research team in IATM. He's in particular a photonic master's student now in, the Denmark, in, in, in Denmark. But be, beyond that, I don't know if that can be an opening to the question of how this, the activities that you will start Will facilitate international cooperation or collaboration with uh, all the type with the researchers abroad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a yeah. Thank you for the question. So uh, it turns out that you know, uh, because this you mentioned this uh, person has uh, in a background in photonics, right? Mm -hmm. It turns out that you know, evaporation is one of the nice ways of making photonic crystals. People have grown photonic crystals just by simple evaporation methods. So we have uh, done some work along the, those lines as well, uh, and to basically uh, to uh, participate in this program remotely. Uh, uh, one way would be computer simulations. You know, you can uh, uh, again, Sumesh and and uh, uh, Idaya are, are are experts. Uh, but you know, you can really do do some simple coding to really understand the the particle mobility in a drying drop. You can write some very simple uh, equations of motion and then look at you know what are the different forces and different you know the, uh, different uh, external uh, fields that contribute to the uh, to the flow of the particle, you know, one could really set up some really nice, simple uh, computer simulations. I think that's an area where probably, you know, we could connect it to anybody who could be interested to look at these things remotely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think the, this answer also, this reply also answers some questions additionally about computational aspects in this in this type of project. I think that that uh, points clearly in that direction. Also sort of like exploring in a different direction, a question by Anshul Kumar. He, he talks about how will uh, the use of soft matter be in the future, maybe a bit more specialized to also the, I mean, this is a big question if you want to address it, but in the context of the of the center that is starting now, uh, you start with this these uh, activities with within drop evaporation. I don't know how do you see that. What's the vision that you have in the future? How it can evolve? Yeah, uh, as as I mentioned, and the evaporation is actually one part of the work that we want to do. I mean, I think there are a lot of other problems as well. Uh, so in the, uh, I mean, if you, if you ask me, the the, the biggest uh, uh, challenge, at least not at least, I mean, in the in the, in the evaporation area. Um, that we want to do is that so far our work has been only around uh, you know model synthetic colloids uh, neater systems uh, you know just single component right but we know that you know a lot of things where the evaporation occurs is, is much more complex if you look at you know for example blood drop there are particles there's plasma there are a lot of different ions you know things are far more complex if you go to you know the actual fluids so that's where we want to go but hopefully along the line, we will build NF model systems so that you know, we isolate the effect of individual components that are, that are part of a complex fluid. And then hopefully understand uh, you know, the influence of uh, each of these components and how do they contribute to you know, the final uh, patterns and diagnostics is, is something that we would like to look at you know, as a part of the larger initiative. Okay. I mean, the, there are quite a number of questions. Uh, some, some of them are, are a bit more uh, scientifically or technical, 
And I, I don't know if maybe there is a possibility for you to reply to them. I think they are valid. And I've tried to uh, yeah. stay on questions that are a bit broader and which touch different aspects and also related to the strategy of your center. Yeah. Maybe I see that we are running, arriving at the end uh, of, of the time that we are allocated. Maybe just taking one more, which is kind of, I think, re reflects also partially other questions by other uh, attendees. There is one by Ashwimi uh, Shenoy, who asks how much of the research involves actual experiments and how much is based on simulations. If you want, maybe a question of how, how do you envisage the interaction between these two types of activities? And uh, I mean, generically in the field and in particular associated to the center uh, that and the activity will start now. Yeah, I think, I think concerning this question on uh, the contribution from the experiments and, and you know, theory and simulation, uh, I think, see, there are areas where probably experiments uh, can lead the way, and I'm sure there are areas where the simulation and theory may lead the way. And I, I in my opinion, you know, they would have to probably go hand in hand, you know, in uh, the success of any 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 particular uh, uh, research project or a, or, a, or a group like 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 ours. And 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 uh, so in our group, I think we have enough expertise on. Uh, simulation as well as experiments and uh, people like Abhijit who could do continuum based uh, uh, modeling, for example. So I think it's a, uh, uh, so in our, in, in our initiative, I think we have a, a good balance of, uh, uh, you know, all the three ingredients that are required for the work, uh, experiment, simulation, and the theory. Um, yeah, that's what I would say at this point. Yeah, and I think that's, that's very good. And I think it provides also uh, reassuring. I mean, some people, some of the attendees were asking, well, if I have a, a, a computational background, is this something where I can engage? Uh, which type of experience? I think that provides uh, also uh, a quite a, a thorough view on, on the challenges, why this is really a timely and a really uh, very hot area that will evolve. And I think especially for young people, this is, uh, you, you said at the beginning, it's a good time to, to think about getting engaged and and at the end, research is just, you bring in your expertise and you work in a very rich interdisciplinary team. So I, I hope you all the best in this uh, new Thank endeavor. You. I'm sure we will see good, excellent science coming out and we will really be tuned in to, to see how, how you uh, work together and uh, move forward, yeah? So thank you. And I thank think- you, I Ignacio. Return, yeah, thank, yeah? You. thank you, Prosek Nash. Thank you so much to... for- moderating the whole event. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ignacio. I think that was really well done, really stuck to time. And we're very cognizant of your time. So, um, but on the other hand, you know, we're very happy to let the discussion go forward. So, Basa, if you want to stay back and answer some yeah. of the questions, you can open the Q&A and you can continue to answer, answer the questions. Although, you know, our, the IRIS team has to run to the next webinar. But yeah. if, um, um, and we also understand if Professor Ignacio has other commitments, but Basa, if you would like to stay back and We'll continue to answer on air the questions. We welcome you to do so. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much. I'll let Richu just formally close this session for, so that we run to the next one. But uh, you can continue to stay back. I'll do Thank that. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Basa. It was a wonderful thank presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Basa, and thank you, Professor Ignacio. It's been absolutely wonderful to listen to the both of you. Even for somebody who does not have the background, the, you know, the presentation was very interesting and a very engaging conversation. So we thank you and special thank you to Professor Ignacio for joining us today. Um, so you can carry on, continue with the conversation. Um, we have a lot of questions here, so you can take those. And um, we've also responded to a couple of the messages. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you to everybody Thank who has joined. We hope to see you all at the next webinar too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. So, Basa, you're able to see the Q&A, right? Yes. Yeah. I will, what I'll do is uh, on the Q&A, I will try and answer them as much as I can. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, we can uh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have them one by one. Yeah, yeah. How, how should we go about it? Uh, yeah, and, and you know, if you want uh, to, you can even do it in parallel. Some of you can answer the questions. Uh, type an answer to the question on the Q and A. So if there's a very easy question that uh, can be quickly answered on Q and A, that's fine too. So it makes uh, so we have all the co-PIs who are on the call, so you can distribute the workload. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Arun. Thanks for joining, Arun. Happy to be here. And I should add that uh, 
apart from already what what has been said already i think uh, what makes this group uh, uh, really unique uh, is the level of collegiality in this group right there's a lot of camaraderie uh, that may not be visible at this point but there is actually, actually a lot of camaraderie in this group so whoever gets to work with this group uh, will definitely have a good time thanks sir thanks for the kind words so basically the 